good to be here. I needed, I needed it. Church, man, I have had one of the roughest weeks you could imagine. I went and took a, uh, went and got certified to be a, an IMSHA teacher for uh, mining. Then I had to teach Philippines. It's just been a, been a busy week. This is not going to be a. This is not going to be a typical message on Second Timothy two fifteen. In fact, I'm getting a little upset with people misusing it all the time, and uh, people think people think that because they've watched one video on a timeline, they're all of a sudden these great approved workmen unto God, and. Uh, we're going to take a little break from the mystery of Christ because what I'm, what I'm wanting to teach tonight is very important. And uh, like I already said, it's not going to be a typical message on right division, but rather a message on skill that's developed by the Word of God. God gave you that book to develop skill in you. Uh, the writer of Hebrews said, everyone that useth milk is what? He's a babe, but what, what is he as it pertains to the word of righteousness? Unskillful. A man that useth milk, a man that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. We're going to see what the skill is. Because notice Paul does not tell Timothy to rightly divide. He only tells him to do one thing in the passage. He didn't say, Timothy, rightly divide the word of truth to show yourself approved unto God. He said, study. The only command in the passage is to study. To show yourself approved unto who? As a what? That needeth not to be what? Why, why, is, this not, why is this workman not ashamed? But he was not told to do that. He was told to study. And rightly dividing is more than just rightly dividing the word of truth as we're going to see. So we're going to talk about developing skill. Right? God gave you His word to do something in you so that you could do something for Him. So that that word could work out of you. Amen? The words of this book are useless and ineffectual until they're understood and applied by men. Amen? It's a paperweight. It's what a lot of people do. They decorate their coffee tables with them. Sure. Leave them in church pews. And... I'm on my fifth Bible, man. Some people got a Bible 30 years ago still as crisp as a brand new $20 bill. Amen? And see, Barney Monroe up in Illinois, he wrote a song, What's the Doctrine For? Why did God give you doctrine? Why did, what's, what's the purpose of the doctrine if you ain't living it out? As John says in 3 John, verse number 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children what? See that word walk? But you know what he said before that? He talked about the truth that is in thee. So before they could walk in truth, that truth had to be in them. But the great joy of John, he had no greater joy than to hear that they walked in that truth. Amen? You say, well, that's John. That's Israel's mail. That's not ours. That's, that's theirs. All right, what about Paul? For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may win debates on TikTok and prove to everybody that you're right and they're wrong. 
What does he say? That you might what? Worthy of the Lord unto all what? You know what Paul's prayer is? His prayer is not for you to be filled. The ultimate goal of his prayer is you walking pleasing unto the Lord. There's nothing more important in heaven and earth than the pleasing of the Creator. As they said in Romans or the book of Revelation, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. All things were created to please God. Paul's desire there is not just so you can be filled up with knowledge. His ultimate desire is for us to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. The filling with knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding is the means by which the walk is produced that, that pleases God. Amen? And so in 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing is not a system. It is not a denomination. It is not a position or an ism. It is a skill that is developed in men who study. It's a skill that people acquire from the Word of God. And it's produced when you study the Bible with the right and only motive of approving yourself personally approved unto God. Yep. Amen? Amen? Any other motive gets in that heart, it's going to mess with it. It's going to mess with what you get out of the book. Amen? We're going to deal with some of this stuff tonight. Now notice I said rightly dividing, but I didn't say anything about the word of truth. All I said was that rightly dividing is something, is a skill that God gives you through His Word. But we're not just talking about rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is just one aspect of rightly dividing. Amen? You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Rightly dividing is the skill of discernment and judgment. You think God only wants you rightly dividing the book? You don't think He wants you rightly dividing good and evil? Amen. Truth and error? Yeah. Yep. Got Christians running around, I'm not Israel, and that's not my mail, that's theirs, not ours. Jesus wasn't talking to me, Jesus wasn't talking to you. Hebrews is not my doctrine. And, and no matter, they've heard that, they didn't learn that stuff from study, they heard that stuff. Yeah. These same people who claim to be these great, great students of the Word of God who can rightly divide the Word of Truth can't even rightly divide between modesty and filthiness. They can't rightly divide the law of the flesh and the law of the Spirit. Amen? They have no discernment of the sufferings of Christ no discernment of the will of God. And they can't discern between, they can't discern the difference between meekness and good words and fair speeches that deceive the simple. They think somebody talks like me is not meek. Injure me. Do me wrong and see how meek I am. What did Jesus say? I am what? Meek? Lowly in heart. You ever heard how he talked to people? He ignored a woman one time. Then when he finally talked to her, he called her a dog. But that man stood before her shears dumb and opened not his mouth. When he was reviled, he took it. People say stuff about me all the time and I just... Water down my back, man. That's a meek man. Meekness has nothing to do with how a man talks to you. Now, meek men are sometimes, they're slow to wrath, they're, they're soft-tempered. But every man in that Bible that was meek, at some point in time, used their tongue to lash and cut and rebuke sharply. You got these modern Christians going around today, I'm, 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 a, I'm a right divider, are you? 
We're not just talking about, man, we're talking about the word of God giving you knowledge and judgment by which you yourself through discernment and discretion can separate things. It gives you the knowledge of what to avoid, what to come out from, what to withdraw from, what to reject. Amen? It's a skill of wisdom, judgment, justice, and equity that gives skill to the simple. Without this skill, you know what you are? You're simple. You know what happens to the simple? They're deceived. That's why they're here one day and completely tossed to and fro the next. And a lot of it comes down to motive, guys, and that's what we're going to look at. Amen? The Word of God teaches you to rightly divide more than His Word. It gives you judgment of all things. Discernment of all things. Amen? Now when we talk about Rightly dividing, what are we talking about? As Dr. Ruckman used to say, things that are different are what? That ought to be simple enough, wouldn't it? Man runs around and says, uh, says there's only one gospel in the Bible. I'm like, have you ever read every verse where the word gospel shows up? And then have you taken and compared those scriptures? Have you compared spiritual things with spiritual and you've concluded that there's only one? Things different are not the same. Men and women are not the same. Light and darkness are not the same. Good and evil are not the same. People see the word kingdom in the Bible and they they just lose their head. They think it's always the same kingdom. Kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are the same kingdom. Well, then you're saying God is heaven. You've made God the creature. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How can the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven be the same? When one of them is the creature and one of them is the creator. You study the Bible. You study the Bible. And as you study it and read it, God is developing in you this skill by which you can rightly divide. You take the first coming and the second coming of Christ. There was Israel's stumbling block. Amen? Sufferings, glory. Cross, crown. Amen? Cross, Mount Calvary, the cross on Mount Calvary, throne of David on Mount Zion. Came into his own and his own received him not. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Psalm 110 verse 3. You read passages about the Messiah in that Bible. Some of them deal with his first coming. Some of them deal with the second advent. They got to be rightly divided. Old covenant, new covenant. You think you got to rightly divide those things? Do you know the differences between those two covenants? You say, no, preacher, that's why we got you. Amen. I don't care to teach you these things. What, I, what, I, what I'm trying to get to is just because you get a little bit of knowledge doesn't mean you're this great laborer that ought to go out here and start tongue lashing people that don't know what you know. Because nine times out of ten you start that stuff and then you paint yourself in a corner and you don't know up from down. And they ask you one question and you come bail me out. I ain't bailing you out. Amen? Why did Paul say we're Abraham's seed? I thought we were in Israel. I don't know, man. You were on there. You were on there bashing everybody for months straight. You know? Kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. That one right there is the kingdom of the Spirit of God. Did you know that? Then there's the kingdom of the Son of Man. You think the Spirit of God and the Son of Man are the same? 
faith and law. There's great people. People people don't even understand these fundamentals. They don't even understand the righteousness which is of faith and the righteousness which is of the law. By the way, did you know faith is a law? The law of faith. There's a law of works. Where is boasting? It is excluded. By what law, Paul said? What law forbids boasting of man? The law of works? Nay, but the law of what? Well, I'm not under the law. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish what? Mm-hmm. They don't even understand these righteousnesses. The righteousness which is of the law, the law of works, is a man lives by doing what's written in that law. The righteousness which is of faith is a gift of God. It is a law that functions in you by the word of God. It is not you just believing a fact and then going on about your day. It is the law of faith working in the believer by which God works His righteousness into that man. It begins with imputed righteousness, but it functions unto functional righteousness by the Spirit of God. Amen. Judgments. How many can you name? This is not to make you... Well, I, it kind of is. To make you... It's, it's, it's to humble us. It is to humble us. Just like God did Job. Amen? They asked, they, they, I think it was a uh, hundred scientists, man. I can't remember what year it was. Dr. Ruckman told this story. They asked a hundred scientists the 38 questions found in Job 38 and 39. Did you know that they did not even understand around 29 to 30 of the questions? Where is the way where light dwelleth? You want to take a stab at it? Do you even understand the question? What light's he talking about? Light in our world doesn't dwell anywhere. It's moving. Where's the way where light dwelleth? Where does God and Jesus Christ dwell? In the light. Where no man can approach unto. You know where your inheritance is? It's in the light. Amen. God's asking a Job a question back there that most men don't even understand the, the question. They think talking about the sun or a light bulb or they don't even know what he's talking about. He's talking about a dwelling and a dominion. And then he says, he says, as for the darkness, canst thou take it to the bound thereof? Do you know what you just learned in Job 38? That the darkness is bound. That black sky, when you look out, when you go outside, understand that that dominion ends somewhere. And outside of that dominion is the dominion of God's light that He, that he instituted and separated all the way back in Genesis 1-3. Sometimes I wish God would just show up on... I just wish He would show up in our midst sometime Ask us about 40 questions so that we'd realize how ignorant we are, what we don't understand, so that we would put our mouth, hands over our mouth and open our ears. People, you know, I, I try to witness the people. You know, you know what I get sometimes? I pray to God. Have you ever thought about shutting your mouth and opening your ears for a change? You see, you're trying to be his God. I pray, but I've never read my Bible. I run my mouth talking to him, but I never incline my ear to his words. Be slow to speak and quick to what? Y'all understanding? How many judgments are in the Bible? 
Do you know the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment? Do you know the difference between that judgment and the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25? Amen? Baptisms. You got people out there that don't even understand the difference between positional and functional doctrine. They don't understand positional death and functional death. They don't understand positional life and functional life. They read, they read sanctification one time in the Bible and thinks that God is never allowed to mention it in another context again. You try to preach on sanctification. I'm sanctified in Christ. Listen, listen to me. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus with all that in every place call upon the name of our Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. Yes. If any man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good works. There's obviously more than one kind of sanctification in that Bible. And you can't even get up and talk about sanctification without some proud egotistical man who thinks he's some great big shot because he learned a few dispensational points. Oh, I'm already sanctified in Christ. Okay. Good luck, man. Amen. Good luck. Y'all understand, man, things different are not the same. America, listen to me, the evidence is all around you. Man can't handle the Bible anymore. But look at your society. Man has lost all capability of discerning and judging. Amen? Just look around you. In fact, they despise any type of judgment and authority. They can't stand the fact that there's only male and female. They can't stand that reality. Amen? They can't stand it. And they, they, want, they want the rest of the world to be subjected to their own imagination of things. But here's the point. If man has lost his discernment of physical things, how corrupt is he spiritually? Amen? And so, and so, we're not just talking about how to draw a timeline. Rightly dividing is a skill of judgment and discernment given to you by the Word of God. Amen? Now notice here, like I've already said, Paul doesn't tell Timothy to rightly divide. He only tells Timothy, he only gives Timothy one command in that verse. I hear people say all the time, the King James Bible is the only book that tells you what to do and how to do it. It doesn't tell you how to do anything in that passage. You think if all you had was that passage right there, you'd know how to study the Bible? Oh, now I know. 2 Timothy 2, you think you could just read that passage and start drawing a timeline up here and putting everything in its proper order. That verse doesn't tell you how to do it. It tells you what to do. Rightly dividing is the result of doing what you're told to do. Amen? Study. You have a command in the passage. Study. You know, the first word and the last word of that passage is study and truth. So we obviously know what we're dealing with. What are we studying, Paul? Obviously the word of truth. Amen? But he, don't only tell, he doesn't only give Timothy the command, he gives him the reason and the motive. Amen? I want to tell you something. The Bible is a discerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart. If the motive ain't right, that book knows it. Amen. If the heart and the motive isn't right, that book knows it. 
You ever wonder why man can't have anything to teach without first correcting the Bible 30 times? You know why? Because that Bible ain't giving him any light. He's got to dumb it down to something he can understand. But then all you're getting is some wisdom he's conjured up out of his own head. He sets and twists and manipulates and rests the scriptures until it's, oh yeah, now I can teach this. Amen? You know what's wrong with that man? That Listen, listen, the problem with that man is long before you get to issues of Greek and Hebrew and English and everything else, the issue's in that man's heart. His motives isn't right. His conscience is not clean. Paul said their conscience is defiled. To the believing, all things are pure. He said, but they, their consciences are defiled, professing that they know God, but in works denying Him, being, an abomin being abominable, and unto every good work, what? Reprobate. You know what that means? Without judgment. They have no capacity to discern and judge a good work. They can't rightly divide good works from evil works. Yep. Amen. Amen. Y'all understand than me. Paul tells Timothy what to do and then he gives him the motive for doing it. Why do you read the Bible, preacher? Why do you study the Bible? For no other reason than to show myself approved unto God. I take this serious up here. I really do, guys. People who know me know how much study and work. I refrain sleep sometimes for a day, day and a half getting in that book. I won't, I'm, I'm never going to be the kind of guy that's like, oh, I'm just too tired. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just throw out something haphazardly tomorrow. Guys, I won't even save my notes just so I'm not tempted to pull them out and be like, I'm just going to preach that tomorrow. I study it every time. And every time I go through it, I find more and I understand more. Because my motive with this book, this is me personally with God. What I'm doing towards you is the work I'm doing to try to please God. I'm not trying to please you. Now God's goal is for me to serve you. This is how I do it. But I'm seeking to please God. I'm seeking to show myself approved unto God. Rightly dividing is the skill that approves you unto God and it's developed by studying with the right motive. Amen? I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of some motives. Right? And this is why the men who with the right motive go like this. And men with the wrong motive go like this. Some of us are increasing with the knowledge of God. Some of us are them falling off the wagon. You say, why, preacher? Motive. This guy here was preaching right division, King James only. Now he's a no-heller and don't even correct in the King James Bible. You know, what a, you know, you know how, what an imbecile you have to be to follow somebody like that that's that unstable and that double-minded? That every six months he's completely starting over? Well, I was wrong for the last five years. Now this is true. Five years from now it's going to be something else. The problem's in the motive. And you can tell these men. You can tell them. One of us is studying to personally show ourselves approved unto God. Another one is studying to see how much of the Word of God he can get rid of. That's how somebody, that's how some people think right division operates. You can always hear it in their speech. Not mine. 
not mine, not putting me under the law, not mine, not mine, that's not about me, that's theirs, not ours, that's Israel's mail. I don't. Yep. Yep. What are you doing back in Psalms? What are you doing quoting Proverbs? Oh, you can't quote John. That somebody with a motive to get rid of as much of that authority of that book as they can in their lives because they don't like it. Amen, preacher. And reality is, it started out with the judgment seat of Christ. Then it started out with, now I want to get rid of hell and eternal judgment. And eternal damnation. Things that are so clear in the Bible that Christians who haven't agreed on anything in 2,000 years all agreed on the eternal damnation of the just, or the unjust. Well, I just don't agree. I want to get rid of it. I want to get rid of it. And the only way you get rid of it was start correcting that authority right there. We know your motives. They're not pure. You come down here and you emphasize. What do you think about a man that emphasizes all men made alive and completely nours in Christ? In Christ shall all be made alive. Paul said all men shall be made alive. In Christ. You telling me all men are in Christ? We know the motive. I know the motive. David Osteen was calling these guys out four years ago. Won't be he said, he said, you wait and see. He's going to start correcting the King James Bible. You know why David Osteen knew that? David Osteen has discernment. He's been studying that book. And that book has given him judgment and discernment. You can't kid him. Amen? The point is, man, we, do we really want to walk around a world that God tells us is completely in darkness, that the majority of it is a lie, that the majority of it is desperately wicked, that there's serpents and deception and strong delusion and wiles all around us all the time? That you may be able to stand against all the what? Wiles of the devil. And you want to walk around this world without discernment and judgment and the ability to judge things for yourself. Paul said that book is able to make thee wise unto salvation from these things. Amen. Amen. We're talking about skill, man. And that skill is developed through studying the Word of God with the right motive. Now, I want to show you how skill is developed. That's Proverbs. I'll get in trouble for that, but I don't care. I don't care what dispensation you're in. This four, You know what these four verses are? They're the syllabus to the book of Proverbs. It's a Solomon telling you why these Proverbs are in your Bible. It's to do four things. So that you can know something, perceive something, receive something, so that you can have something. And what he wants you to have is skill. That book takes you from being simple to being a skillful man. Now I don't care what dispensation you're in. Those same four principles apply. I can show you those same four principles throughout Paul's epistles. Know ye not. Know ye not. Know ye not. Know ye not. Here's the instruction. Reckon yourselves. Neither yield yourselves. You know what that instruction's doing? It's giving you something. Amen. Amen. But you got to perceive it. This is how this thing works. This is how it works. You take the Word of God to know. 
That's the first step. Some people have possessed the King James Bible for most of their life and don't know the contents of it. And I promise you, I know what's in that book. Some of it is some of the most boring, miserable things you'll ever read. People's like, it's like Corin said. You know it's the Word of God, man. It's, it's, it's movies, man. Movies are not what's real, guys. Nobody lives lives like that. The majority of that Bible is, is about real life. Man getting visited and saying, honey, go in the kitchen and cook something. And then they sit down and talk. Man loses an ass and his two sons go out and find it and bring it back. And... <laughs> Right? But God gave you that book to know it. We was talking about this the other day. We're grown-ups in here. Adam knew his wife. That book was given to you so that you could become intimate and familiar with wisdom and instruction. You don't embrace her. Listen to how the Bible talks about her. Embrace her. Exalt her. She shall be an ornament of grace under thine head. You know what he's telling you to embrace? To exalt? You know what he's telling you to lie with in your bosom? In your bed at night? We are to be intimate with this book. To know. What's the second thing? Perceive. To perceive. How's that happen? I'm going to show you. To know. How do we do that? Incline thine ear to perceive the words of understanding. So this knowledge, this knowledge goes into us, but guess what? It can't function until we ourselves understand it. Amen? So what we have to do is perceive. How do we perceive these things? The eyes of your what? Being what? That Christ may dwell where? Right? That's, that's over in another chapter. But that Christ may dwell in your hearts by what? Alright? So this knowledge comes in, but we have to perceive it. Incline thine ear and apply thy what? Apply thine heart to understanding. You take in the word and then you apply your heart to understand this knowledge that God's given you. Now there's a time when it's like seeing darkly through a glass. But the more you grow up, the more you begin to see and understand these things. To perceive the words of understanding. What's the next step to what? So what is, what is this understanding giving you? Instruction. Through perceiving this knowledge, through understanding this knowledge, we are receiving instruction of what? Wisdom. What else? Justice. Judgment. Equity. Boy, that's a good thing to walk around with. Amen? A man that has this instruction built up inside of him ain't going to walk in darkness. Amen? And what is this instruction for? To give what? To who? The simple. And so this instruction working out of us is what gives us skill in the Word of God. And to the young man, knowledge in what? You know what discretion is? It's the ability to separate things through judgment. Discreet is to walk cautiously, as Paul would say, walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. Amen? 
<clears throat> so we're talking about knowledge and discretion. So I'm, you say, what are we talking about, preacher? I'm talking about rightly dividing be a little bit more than understanding a couple of time periods in your Bible. You want to see this same process? Shall we continue in what? Shall we continue in sin? Here? God forbid. Know ye not. What's he doing? Giving you knowledge. And I promise you this. He gives you the knowledge all the way down to verse 10 and then he begins to instruct you. But you know what you have to have to receive the instruction moving forward? You have to have a perception of the knowledge he just gave you in the first 10 verses. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, knowing that Christ being. You've got to perceive those words. You've got to understand them. And then from there on, he begins to instruct, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. The instruction is based upon the understanding of the knowledge. Same process. And you know what Paul's doing through this knowledge and understanding and that instruction? He's given you the skill to walk after the Spirit in newness of life, serving God in newness of spirit. That's where he's leading you to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And that skill of being led of the Spirit, walking after the Spirit, gives us this newness of life by which we can now live unto God and serve Him in newness of Spirit. How would the God... I've, I've, I've probably heard 200 preachers in my life and none of them ever taught this stuff. Shame. Shame. And it ain't just the Baptist either. You see this knowledge here? What good is the knowledge without what? Without understanding. I'd rather speak five words with understanding than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. Right, I'll put these words up here. Y'all ain't going to understand them. Don't worry about it. I'm making a point. How many of y'all know what that stuff is? How many of y'all know what black damp is? White damp, fire damp, stink damp. It has to do with coal mining. Right? It does. This is, this is all stuff I had to learn when I went and took my foreman test in West Virginia. Six hour test. Listen, to you that doesn't mean anything. When I first learned it, it didn't mean a whole lot. But over the years I began to understand or there was a time when all this knowledge become understandable to me and it made me a skilled coal miner. Right? Guys, you can't skip the education process. I know people hate education. They hate learning. Right? I had to sit through a class on mine gases. Learn their specific gravity. Methane is 0.555 and... Carbon dioxide is 1.529. But you know why that stuff's important? Because I'm working in a dangerous atmosphere and those gases cannot be seen, heard, or smelled. So you have to have the knowledge of how those gases behave in a physical atmosphere. Methane goes, goes like that. Carbon dioxide goes that way. So if I'm wanting to check for methane, I ain't down here on my knees going, oh, there ain't no methane here. That's skill. But I didn't get the skill until I took in the knowledge, understood it, and received from that understanding the instruction necessary to become a skilled man. 
I don't care what field you're in. Welding, diesel, engineering, you only receive skill through that process right there and God's spiritual skill is the same way. Yes. Watch. You want to see it? You want to see it? Everyone that useth milk is what? In the word of what? Now we ain't talking about the word of truth there, are we? Are they one and the same? Right? The word of truth. So what do, what, what do you think the skill God's trying to get you to receive through his word? It obviously has something to do with righteousness. And a man that useth milk is unskillful in that word of righteousness, for he is a what? He don't know how to use it yet. He don't know how to apply it. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full what? Even those who by reason of use have their senses what? To do what? Or rightly divide both good and evil. Discernment. Amen? So what's the skill God wants His Word to develop? Discernment of good and evil. And a man that uses milk is unskillful in that. He can't tell you who's telling the truth and who's lying. He can't tell you which church he ought to go to. He can't make decisions. You know what decision? You ever think about words like decision, circumcision, concision? Decision is you cutting away one choice and separating it and saying this is the right choice. And you understand that decision through discernment. Amen, boys. I know where I'm at, what I'm doing, if nobody else does. You say, how'd you get there, preacher? This book. My, let, me, let me change that. My God knows where he's at and what he's doing. I'm just a byproduct of that. Amen? Well, that's Hebrews, preacher. Okay, let's see what Paul said about it. The natural man. Now what was Paul talking about, or what was he talking about here? Senses. You see that? Senses. You ever heard of common sense? Don't have good sense. Oh, that's bad sense, right? If it don't make any sense, there's a buck in it, right? You ever heard that? <laughs> well, Paul, right here, he's not talking about the senses of the natural man. Amen? Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are what? Okay. So you think he's talking about spiritual, you think he's talking about natural senses there? You think he's talking about spiritual senses? A man has to have his spiritual senses exercised by the word of God to become a man of judgment and discernment. Watch what he says about the spiritual man. But he that is spiritual, what? Yet he himself is judged of who? There it is. So what, what do you think, where do you think this spiritual man, how do you think he judges all things? He judges all things through having his spiritual senses exercised by the word of God to discern both good and evil. Therefore, a spiritual man is a man of judgment. One of my favorite books Ruckman ever wrote, and I'm getting ready to use a word that some of you have let the media absolutely just use and misuse so that you're scared to death of it. Ruckman wrote a book called Discrimination, the Key to Sanity. And see, you've, you've let the media tell you discrimination is about racism. I set a bunch of pill bottles on the table. You going to treat them all the same? You going to discriminate? I set a bunch of bottles of liquid on the table. You going to discriminate? You going to just accept them all the same? You going to treat the red light like the green light? You go through this world without discrimination and you're going to lose your mind. And you're going to destroy yourself and your family and everything else. 
I tell you what, man, you see a guy standing on a street corner, tatted up from his ankles, got tattoos down his neck and on his eyeballs and across his forehead and got no shirt on and pants hanging down his hind end. If you don't have the discernment and the discrimination to lock the doors on your car to keep your family safe from people like that, shame on you. Discernment, discrimination, those things will keep you safe. Running around the world with this liberal view is what's destroying everybody. It's letting, it's letting, letting perverts and mentally ill people into the school systems to pervert children and everything. Well, we don't want to discriminate. Okay. See, how, see, see, see where you are in 20 years, 30 years. I've been watching America do this since 19, since I was old enough to remember. Just headed to the dumpster fire, man. Because nobody reads and studies the book and let their senses be exercised to discern good and evil. Amen? Y'all with me? Can I go for just a few more minutes? Yeah. As long as you want. Study. Now I'm going to show you the first step. Right there is the first step. You can't obey this until you got that. There's the first step. Word of truth. Do you have it? Do you have it or don't you have it? And I'm going to tell you, it's, this is not an issue of intellect, history, manuscript evidence. This is an issue of conscience. You either got the book or you don't. Amen? You know what man's real problem is? Authority. Y'all ever, ever heard the old saying, that guy's as stubborn as a mule. You know what God said in the book of Job? And I got to tell you what God said before you get offended about what I'm about to say. You know what God said in the book of Job? Man is as a wild ass. You can sit and, listen, man, you take a wild ass, you can kick him, you can beat him on the back, you can try to pull him, and if he don't want to move, he ain't going to move. He's not subject to authority. And guess what you can't do with a wild ass and an unbroken ass? You can't put a yoke on him. He's useless. Now let me ask you something. What do you do with an ass that ain't redeemed? You break its neck. That's Exodus chapter 13. Read it sometime. You'd be amazed what you can get out of that Bible. Why did God, right there in the midst of talking about redemption, just throw this little thing in there? And if thou wilt not redeem the firstling of the ass, thou shalt break its neck. Then you come, you come around a lot later and you start learning about a body and a head and Amen. The point reason I'm saying that is because until you break a wild ass, until this book can break the wild ass and bring him in subjection, he has no hope of doing what I'm talking about. Until a man in his conscience believes that that book is the authority of God, go do something else. You ain't going to be a preacher. And I mean that. You got to believe, you got to begin and believe what Moses believed about the Bible. You got to believe what David believed about the book and Jesus and Paul and Peter. Not a single man of that Bible talked like 85% of the preachers in the world today. Look at what Moses said about it. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not what? Neither is it what? It is not where? It wasn't hiding in the Dead Sea Scrolls either. The, the caves of the Dead Sea. 
wasn't hiding out in a wastebasket at the Sinai Peninsula at a monastery. It ain't locked up in the Vatican. What Moses, is, what Moses is wanting the children of Israel to understand here is that this word operates through faith. Paul uses this to say the righteousness of faith speaketh on this wise. God, God, God told him, he said, the word ain't in heaven. That's you got to tell somebody to go up there and bring it down to us. He said, it's not beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us that we may hear it and do it. You ever heard people talk like that? Well, I believe the originals were inspired, but I don't believe we have them. Well, where's it at then, bud? What did God say? The word is very what? In thy what? And in thy, that thou mayest what? That's how faith operates. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. How can a man live by faith when he don't even believe he has a Bible? A man who says he doesn't have the inerrant, perfect word of God is an unrighteous man. I don't care what his doctrine is. If he doesn't believe that he has the word of God, he's unrighteous because righteous men don't talk like that. Righteous men have the word of God very nigh to them in their mouth and in their heart. Unrighteous men are still looking for it. You getting that stuff? You better get it. David, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified how many times? God, listen, according to that, the words of the Lord were purified seven times. How are you going to correct them? How can God's words be pure and purified in the furnace of earth seven times and a man stand up behind the pulpit and be a better way of saying it? Oh, you can purify it better than God? Listen. The word is nigh thee in thy mouth and in thy heart. Is it? The words of the Lord are pure. Are they? These are your questions. This is the question for man. I know where I stand. I've been convinced of it a long time. You ain't going to see me backing up. Let's make a 40-part series and see if we can figure out where the Bible is. I'll see if you ever get caught up. Thy word is true from what? Is it? Do you have it? Do you have a book that begins in the beginning? And do you believe that that book that you have that begins in the beginning is true from that point forever? Yes. Amen. All Scripture is given by what? And is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be what? Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Do you have it? Now think about what I just asked you. Do you have the inspired scriptures? Do you have scriptures that were given to you by inspiration? I want you to think about what I'm about to ask you. Do you believe that God put that King James Bible in your possession? And he gave you that King James Bible by inspiration. Because that's where I stand. Oh, that's double inspiration. They never understood inspiration anyway. What they learned from inspiration, they learned from a theological seminary, not out of a Bible. Listen, listen. You say, you really believe the Bible you have is inspired? If I didn't, I wouldn't be up here. Because the man of God... God gave this book, why? That the man of God may be what? Thoroughly what? If I don't have the inspired book, I don't have what I need to do the work of God. You getting that stuff? What do you believe about the book you possess? 
Because I know what I believe about it. Amen? You know what? You know what the problem is? Everybody does well with this. It's when that, it's when that book starts trying to correct and reprove that they get... <sighs> then it becomes convenient to be like, oh, well, what it really means and oh, a, a better way of saying it and this Greek word and everybody's a Bible believer until that book crosses them. You ever watch a Calvinist dealing with a Calvinist passage? Not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. No, 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 you have to believe what it says. Read it, read it, read it. You got to believe what it says. God will have all men to be saved. Well, what he means. Yeah. You ever watch them? <laughs> They're all Bible believers until that book crosses their biased, prejudiced yep. view. Preach. They've got their mind made up before they ever got to the book. And when the book goes against what they believe, they judge the book, but they will not allow the book to judge them. That's right. It's good reason. That's, that's issues of motive. You think anybody like that's ever going to learn how to rightly divide anything? As Donnie Holt said, they couldn't rightly divide a Kit Kat. <laughs> Do you have the word of truth? Yes, sir. Now, now that you know that you got the word of truth. What do you got to do? You got to study it with the motive of approving yourself unto God. Now, I'm going to close here. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. Whom shall he teach? What? Remember this? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Isn't that where we started? What is God wanting to give us? Skill, how's he going to do it? Through teaching knowledge and giving us understanding of doctrine. That word doctrine there takes you back to this. Whom shall he teach? That's doctrine. And whom shall he make to understand what? This teaching. So the question is, is whom does God teach knowledge and who does he make to understand his doctrine? The answer is right there. Them that are weaned from the milk... And drawn from the... What's the first book of the Bible I should read? Well, how about the last one? That seems like a good place to start. I want to read the last book of the Bible first. Watch your name out of the book. Total security is a false doctrine! I'm going to stand on the street corner now. I'm the only one that's got it figured out. You know what he skipped? Guys, there's a process in that passage. It's God's procedure. If you skip the procedure and the process, he can't teach you and make you understand anything. I don't care what man has to say about it. Look at what he says. Does the word must right there for precept what? Does that, does that sound optional to you? If you want God to teach you and give you understanding, then precept must be upon precept. That's how he teaches. That's how he gives you understanding. Precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. And the fact that he's saying that this man must be winged for milk Remember what Paul, Paul remember what Hebrew said. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. What's, what's God doing through this teaching and this understanding? He's given you the ability to receive meat. Right? This is how God is going to wing you from the milk and from the breast. Is going precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Remember Peter, desire the sincere that you may grow thereby. Remember it? Precept must be upon precept. You know what that means? It means you can't hop, skip around the Bible taking the passages that back up your prejudice. Precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Amen? That's what it looks like right there.
That's illustration. You start with this precept here, but that precept was designed to be upon three other precepts before you got to it. But you skip to that one. I like that one. I like what I think that one means. You follow me? God goes precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. Well, what if you get this little and never get that little? Amen? You getting it? You know what that is right there, guys? You know what I just showed you right there? That is God's procedure and process for teaching knowledge and giving understanding of his doctrine. And he's taking you from a baby that's on milk to a man that's of full age that's eating the meat of the word of God. Amen? Shall we call it a curriculum? Do you know what the word curriculum means? All it means is subjects that lay out a course of study. A course. That looks like a course to me. There's the subjects. A course of study. You use the word curriculum today and people just, just lose their mind. You know why they lose their mind? They don't want to have to go through the process. Amen? They want to make memes and because they know they haven't been through the process. The process don't bother me. I've been through it. I've read that book line upon line, precept upon precept. I've wept over it. I've cried over it. I've stared at it. Amen? That's a process. People want to hop, skip around. They don't want to obey that process. And they're never going to learn knowledge and understand doctrine. Amen? God cannot teach you and give you understanding if that procedure is ignored. Amen? Why do you think the Jews didn't believe on Jesus Christ? Because they didn't learn a thing from the schoolmaster. Amen? When the writer of Hebrews writes Hebrews 6.1, he just got done talking about you have become such as have need of milk. He's talking about Jesus Christ, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he says, of whom we have many things to say which are hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. He said they're hard for us to say because... You can't hear. And he said, and you've, he says, for the time when you ought to be teachers of these things, you have become, he said, he, he said, you have need that one teach you what? Again, which be the first what? Principles. God had already taught them principle after principle after principle. And now it's time to receive this doctrine of Christ and these things of Christ and they're not ready to receive them. They have, they have need that somebody take them all the way back here to the beginning and teach them again the first principles of the oracles of God. Amen? Look what he tells them to do in chapter 6. People get so messed up in this chapter. They think, they think he's telling them to leave the doctrine of Christ. So oh, that means leave the earthly ministry of, of things Christ. He just told them in chapter 2 to give the more earnest thing, more, a more earnest heed to the things that they heard from God's Son. You think four chapters later, he's like, now leave them. Today, if you hear his voice, now leave. What is he talking about here? There's two things here. There's principles and doctrine of Christ. 
The doctrine of Christ is the perfection. The principles were taught so that they could understand that doctrine when it came. He taught them principles of blood sacrifice, a priest. All those things were shadows of good things to come. They were principles being taught to the nation of Israel so that they could receive the meat when it came. And here they were, that doctrine come, that, 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 that perfection came, and they need somebody to take them all the way back and teach them these principles again. Look at what he says. Therefore, leaving, go on, not laying again. You see it? When you understand what he's talking about, he's saying it's time to leave the principles and go on to perfection and not lay again the foundation that's already been laid. You understand? God laid the Mosaic law. Principles, principles, principles. And now it's time to build upon those principles this doctrine of Christ. Paul follows the same pattern. And I really am closing here, guys. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know how many Christians I've heard hang their hat on that passage? Only know Christ and Him crucified. Been saved 30 years, bro. All I know is Christ and Him crucified. Mm -hmm. they, 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 you see, they think they understand the passage. What Paul, what Paul, Paul didn't say that's all he knew. He said, I determined not to know anything among you. It's not all he knew. It was all he determined he was going to share with the Corinthians. How be it, look at what he says now. How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, meaning we know more. We possess more. We have a whole lot more, brethren. But we only speak it among them that are... Why? Strong meat belongs to who? Full of age. Then he tells them, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. What does a carnal man not have? He doesn't have the sermon of spiritual things. You getting it? So what does a carnal man need? He needs milk, not meat. Now watch. Let us therefore as many as be what? We speak wisdom among them that are what? I couldn't speak unto you as unto what? Let us therefore as many as be. You getting it? You think Philippians? You think Philippians is milk or meat based on what we've learned? Now, I get in trouble for that kind of stuff. Oh, you don't think. Okay, tell me what you think. You think you can just jump to a book in the back of the Bible where Paul says you fully know my doctrine and you ain't even read any of it. That book is laid out in a process, in a procedure. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Paul's epistles follow the same process that the whole Bible has followed. Your foundation is in Romans. Corinthians is the milk for babies. Galatians is correction of little children. Ephesians is doctrinal education of, of children to bring them into adulthood. Philippians is compelling them to walk as the sons of God. Colossians is about the perfecting and right there at the top you have the church which Paul said was the examples to all who believe. There it goes. I don't agree with it, preacher. Well, see if it works in you. Amen. I know what it's doing in me. I know exactly what it's doing in me. You got you to gotta believe that book. You got to believe what the Bible says about that book. True from the beginning. Pure. You can't correct it. You can't improve it. It doesn't have a single error in it. The Word of God is not some 
figment of man's imagination, not some lost pieces of paper. You got men running around, can't even understand we and they, and they want to talk to you about Hades and Guiana. Next time a man starts running his mouth about Greek and how the King James translators didn't understand it, I'm going to take my new Greek New Testament, I'm going to shove it in his nose and say, I want that chapter translated by tomorrow. And you're not allowed to use a lexicon or anything else. You're such a big shot that you can correct a book that's been saving sinners, purifying sinners, Raising the dead, giving them life to live, exalting them into the heavenly places. If you're so smart that you can correct that book, you shouldn't have a problem translating a chapter of the Greek without any other tools. Let's see it. You got to believe that book. Study that book to show yourself approved unto God. It's between you and God. And you got to study that book line upon line, precept upon precept. When it's hard, when it's dark, to understand the proverb and the interpretation and the words of the wise and their dark sayings. You got to study that book when it's dark. That book is light. It's your ignorance that can't perceive that book. And what God is going to do is He's going to develop you inwardly to where you can start perceiving more and more of the light of His Word. Before long, that light will be shining in your hearts just like it shined out of darkness in the beginning. Amen. And it will give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to close there. I've kept you all long enough. <clears throat> When God teaches us this wisdom, guys, you have, to, uh, you have to understand that when God teaches you this wisdom, Paul said that, that when we learn this wisdom, when it comes out of our mouths, when we speak this wisdom of God, we speak it in words that have been taught to us by the Holy Ghost. That means when a spiritual man speaks... You have to understand that he's speaking with words that have already been taught to him by the Holy Ghost. You getting that? When I get up here and I use words, y'all don't heard it tonight. Decision. The Spirit of God has taught me his vocabulary. Right? Not all of it. But if you want to understand the words of the Holy Ghost, you got to leave those words alone, first and foremost. Yeah. And the second thing you got to do, if you want to understand words, he tells you how. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Amen. Now, we don't have any excuse. There was a time, man, when, you know, when I was a kid, going back even before that, men, men used to have a Bible like this and didn't have a concordance. They'd have to read it and say, where did I see that word gospel? So we can forgive them. They didn't have the tools. But men like that said, man, wouldn't it be great if we had a tool that every time the word gospel's in the Bible, we could have a book knowing where it's at and men sat down and wrote concordances. Now you got computer programs that you go on your phone, type gospel, and they'll give you every time it's used in the Bible. And you're too lazy and too stubborn to go and compare spiritual things with spiritual things so the Holy Ghost can teach you how He uses that word. Then you get all bent out of shape when a man uses it correctly. Because if you go compare spiritual things with spiritual and you compare every time the word gospel is used, you're going to learn some stuff. Amen? Dispensation, go study it. Dispensation of the fullness of times, dispensation of the gospel, dispensation of the grace of God. Go study these things. Covenant, go, go study it. You want to understand a covenant? People's like, there's no difference between a covenant and a testament. They're the same word and there you go, worried about that Greek, ain't you? 
I can prove to you without Greek or anything else that a covenant and testament are not the same. There's covenants all through that Bible where nobody died. A testament's not in force until the death of a testator. They're different. Amen. Y'all with me? You understanding? You want to understand the words? You've got to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Amen. And then God will, as you, as you do that, you develop the skill and the discernment of God's word in you. It's not only going to give you the ability to rightly divide his word. It's going to give you the ability to judge and approve things that are excellent in your life. It's going to purify you by judgment and justice and discernment and all these things inwardly that God has built up inside of you through the instruction of his word. You'll say, that's evil, I'm staying away from it. That's darkness, I want no part of it. That's true, that's pure, that's where I want to be. There's purity, there's cleanness. Mm -hmm. And through that discernment and judgment, God will... God will teach you how to walk worthy of him and pleasing unto him. Amen. Guys, I'm, listen, I'm not jumping on to anybody. Don't go home and beat yourself up. That's not what I want. This is not for your destruction. This is for your edification. Amen. None of us are there. But I understand how it works, how it operates. And it's functioning in me, but it ain't perfected in me yet. I just want you to understand how it works so that you can go home and see, see why it's so important to get this book inside of you. It is safe. It's, it's holy. It's clean. It's pure. And it'll protect you. God is a buckler. He keepeth the paths of judgment. He is a shield. He layeth up wisdom for the righteous. God has laid up wisdom for the righteous and that wisdom of God is the, is, the, is the very thing that keeps the way of His saints and preserves them. It protects them. It's a shield. It ain't God standing up there and br br put some force field around you. He protects you through the sound wisdom. Yes. Yep. Good. Amen. I'm sorry, guys. I need to shut up. Uh... Brother Les, you want to you wanna close this out, brother? People, some people got to travel long distance. I'm sorry, Mary, Miriam. Thanks, man. Father, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit of God, who is our guiding force. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God, who is our guiding force. And Lord, that is the force that is with us. It's the Holy Spirit, and He's going to serve us.